Welcome everyone to our NCAA social series here in Indianapolis. I'm Andy Katz. Pleased to be joined by Dr. Mark Emmert, NCAA president, and want to do sort of a status update on three main topics here uh, that certainly have uh, changed over the last uh, year, really during the pandemic. So let's start with name, image, and likeness. Where are we right now in that? Yeah, let's well, talk about change in a year. It's been uh, extraordinary change in three months. So we're we're around three months into uh, the new world of NIL. So we've we've been able to see some pretty remarkable, exciting things uh, that are really fun for for student athletes, and of course, in some cases, rewarding, uh, very rewarding financially, and that's a great thing. We're also seeing some challenges there. So. Uh, just to review the bidding really fast, if you remember, we, we had a set of rules already to be passed by the members. We're about to do that. We had some intervention by the Department of Justice saying, wait a minute, we have some concerns. We worked through that. Then we got a shift in the legal environment because of the Supreme Court. And then uh, we were working with Congress trying to get a national standard passed. And then July 1 hits, and we had to put in temporary policies and we've got about 35 states now with different kinds of laws all around the country. Most of them have a lot of similarities, but they all got some differences. So that's allowed uh, almost every student athlete that wants to to do an NIL deal. Uh, we're seeing lots of them that are, you know, fifty, hundred dollar deals or a pizza here, a pizza there. You know, all fun. Seen, and then we're getting reports of things up to a million dollars, where there's big, broad sponsorship arrangements going on. Uh, all of that is fine, uh, enthusiastically supportive of all of that, but still working with Congress to try and get one set of rules for the whole country so an athlete doesn't have to wonder what their state rule is, where they're, where they're living or where they're going to school. They know what their legal protections are because right now they don't. Uh, they, they know what's permissible and not permissible, uh, that there's uh, better boundaries around what's a recruiting inducement versus what's a legitimate NIL deal. That's still in play. So as recently as the past week or two, I've been in front of Congress yet again talking about the need for a national um, policy. Congress is ready to do it. They, they know that we've got to have a national standard. There's no disagreement. They understand that in order for this to work best for students, it needs to be some continuity around the country, but getting Congress to act right now is a, is a challenge in, in almost any, any space. And so we're going to keep working with them. I think we'll get there, but it's, it's hard. Yeah, so to that point, obviously, uh, we know there's plenty of the news of what Congress is dealing with on larger issues. Uh, what's the timeline if it doesn't get pushed more to the forefront between now and the convention for the NCAA in January? Yeah, I think the Polit the political reality is the political deadlines are if, if we can't get something done by February or March, so right after our national convention, it's going to be hard to get anything passed in this Congress because they, they're going to start midterm election battles really early this year. So by the time you get to February, March, somewhere around there, it's going to be hard to get anything through Congress. So we got some really good leadership, both parties, both the uh, House and the Senate, serious intent, trying to get some things done. Uh, I think we got a, a very serious chance of doing it, but it's, it, it's going to be hard, no you, question. You mentioned about 35 different states. I mean, obviously, we know athletes transfer all over the country. I mean, yeah, That's one of the problems. Right. right? <laughs> so, I mean, to that point, and how, how, how much do we need to see this? Because if you were a player in one state and you had one set of rules and then you transfer after two years to another state, you're going to have to go through a whole other learning curve because it may not be equal. Well, that's exactly right. And, and similarly, there's restraints in some states on the kinds of NIL deals you can do, and they're not in other states. So if you do an NIL deal here, you transfer to that other state, what does that mean? Are you exposed there? There's some requirements, some really positive things around education and support for uh, being able to understand what a legitimate deal is or isn't and what contractual rights you have or don't have. And then there's no, uh, right now there's no national or even statewide clearinghouse on what are these deals, we don't want to be doing that, the NCA, but uh, we want Congress to help set up a clearinghouse so you can see what these deals are, so you can get a, cha get a chance to understand where risks are and where opportunities are for students and, and actually make it work better for them. So lots of, lots of issues that are starting to percolate up now. And then the other big one is around just competitive fairness across schools. Uh, is this being used as a real legitimate NIL deal where there's 
um, an exchange for value, like value, or is it simply a recruiting inducement that's been arranged for by the school, and that's what everybody wants to prevent. So uh, there's, a, there's a dark underbelly to this, too. We've all evolved on all sorts of issues. Where do you think you and other presidents evolved the most on this issue? I think uh, working with the students over the past few years, you know, the biggest change that's occurred in maybe five years or so has been in the social media space and the idea of people becoming social influencers and being able to monetize their NIL in this whole new wild world of, of digital media and social media is, uh, we've been talking about it, it seems like forever, but actually not. It's been, you know, five, uh, five or so years. And sitting down with students and, and learning from them, some, from some of our athletes, here's what I do, here's how I make it work, here's how I wish I could do more. Uh, that was really an epiphany, I think, for a lot of people to see uh, that, that we were in a place where we could do a lot more without, without having an un, uh, inappropriate impact on college sports. All right, so I want to shift to gender equity. Uh, the independent review came out, obviously, over the summer. We've talked about that. Um, already we've seen a couple of things. Uh, March Madness now will be used as a branding for men's and women's basketball. Uh, discussion of a potential uh, one site Final Four no earlier than 27 because of contractual agreements for both the men and the women yes. uh, through 26, including with the women in Dallas in 23, all three divisions, one, two, and three of the women yeah. will be in one spot. Um, and obviously there's a lot of other issues that are within the gender equity review, excuse me. Um, so what was your sort of first thoughts of what you saw come out of the initial review and, and, and action items. Yeah, well, I'm really heartened by it. So uh, we basically had to split the recommendations into two components, those that could be done uh, administratively by you know, changing committee structures and getting people to meet more frequently, change some things inside my office. And then there were those that required uh, decisions to be made by the schools, like uh, the, the obvious notion of, of agreeing to do... Uh, Final Four is in, in one site, and that's a, a conversation that's got on between the men's and women's basketball oversight committees, and they could have gone in and said, well, let's, let's try and break a contract or two here and do it sooner, but they reached the conclusion that that wasn't necessarily the right Unanimously, thing Unanimously, by the way. Unanimously, complete, complete agreement on it. Yeah, so it was those committees that agreed to it, and, and they haven't even agreed that they want to have a a dual uh, championship, uh, Final Four championship in one site. But they all agreed that even if we want to do it, we don't want to do it until we've gone through this contract cycle. So that gives them time to think it through a little bit more and make sure they're doing it right. Uh, 23, there, as you pointed out, the, the women's tournament's going to have all three divisions in one site for the Final Four. That'll be great. Uh, it's also the 50th anniversary of Title IX, so they're going to make it a big celebration around all of that. I think that'll work well. Uh, the decisions around co-branding with March Madness, those two groups have agreed to it. We've been able to get support for our corporate sponsors around the use of that mark in both cases. And now we'll get a chance to activate around that and, and be able to uh, cross-promote in ways that'll be a lot of fun. Got some work to do yet with our media partners, of course. Um, but we'll get there. That That's good work internal. We've also got some stuff that's inside baseball that people don't pay attention to, but we're doing zero-based budgeting. We're putting in place an accounting system so we can make sure that we understand how, p how programs are being supported equally and fairly, and uh, that's moving along. We've got the men's and women's staff working together much more collaboratively than ever before. I, I'm completely confident that we'll have a fabulous women's basketball tournament this year. What really counts to me is making sure it's systemic, that we do that every year that that's not a one-off that's normal and we're going to have in a few weeks here a week or two or three depending uh we're going to have the second report coming in from the kaplan group around the other championships and making sure we've got equity there and the board of governors will be talking about that uh, in the uh, their end of october meetings so to that point um in talking to uh both committees over the last couple of weeks i got the sense that they are working together now. And maybe they were before, but maybe not as often. Um, how much do you want to see all the sports really at least maybe not meet all the time together, whether it's virtually in person, but really know what the other one is doing for you know men's and women's soccer or golf, you name it, that there's at least talking amongst each other as to what they're providing for their championships. 
Uh, well, I think it's essential, and I'm excited that, that basketball has been you know, a really good exemplar of how to do this, because I think men's and women's basketball are doing it really well now. They, they know they're not going to try and do things identically. They don't want to do things identically, but they want to learn from each other. They want to be able to share uh, their advice and counsel and, and know what the other group is doing. And we need to be doing that across the board everywhere. It's simple. Uh, you can learn a lot. Uh, there's always been a tendency to be siloed around sports. I get that. Uh, but this is a case where we can open up a lot more and, and learn a lot and put, you know, put on better events for the student athletes. I know you don't have jurisdiction on the campus level, but this is at the championship level. Um, I think we've seen it more and more. I mean, there used to be times when there was just a women's athletic department, uh, in large part because there wasn't maybe one before. I mean, how much would you like to see this happen even more on the campus level? of the integration of both the men and the women working together. Yeah, well that too has to happen, right? Uh, because we're going to we're going to make sure now that the NCAA championships, the national championships are an exemplar of what this can and should look like and everybody is going to have that expectation now that this is the norm. This is what it's supposed to look like at a conference level, at a campus level, and that's a really good thing. We yeah, we don't have authority over that, but you you can you can be the role model for it and Look, we all saw last uh, last year in San Antonio, we were anything but a role model. We we had some things go fundamentally wrong there that should never, ever have happened. And and we've got to get in there now and fix it and go from being a you know problem child to being the exemplar of doing it right. And that's my commitment. All right, Constitution Committee, last topic here. Yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Robert Gates uh, is chairing the committee. Um, we spoke with him a couple of weeks ago and was talking us through the timeline of November and December. Uh, the survey obviously uh, brought back uh, significant results, but also um, interesting opinions, not surprisingly, that certain divisions would like more control at the presidential mm -hmm. level, other divisions would maybe like it more at the athletic director level. Uh, where, <laughs> where are things going right now? And to, well, first, what was your reaction to what, what came back uh, you know, from uh, the survey? Well, it was consistent with what I hear on a regular basis. You know, you meet with one group and, and their opinion is, you know, we're not involved enough. You meet with another group and they're saying, we're not involved enough. And yeah, that's perfectly natural. You'd expect that. Uh, and there are massive differences across the divisions. And even in Division I, there's huge differences between the, the lowest resource schools and the highest resource schools. They're, they're massively different in size and role, scope, and mission of the school. And so that, that wasn't surprising at all. The committee right now, and, and Secretary Gates, by the way, is doing a masterful job of trying to get everybody work, working together and keeping them focused and, and driving it forward. He's a taskmaster master in a very positive way. Um, but they're working through those issues and ideas, and the, the fundamental principle around the Constitution is that this is going to support all three divisions. So it's the foundation on which all three divisions build their bylaws and their rules and their governance processes. So th the key here is to, to provide as much flexibility to each of the divisions to devolve from the national board level down to the, the divisional board level, and then even in turn where it's appropriate to the conference and even to the schools, a lot of the decision-making processes makes it more streamlined, makes it more effective, um, gets the decisions where they can more readily be made with better information. So the, the uh, working group, the Constitutional Review Committee has done, I think a really nice job of providing that kind of latitude, uh, that kind of flexibility. They've still got a lot of work to do. They're gonna roll it out in November in front of uh, the whole membership and say, okay, here's what we're thinking of, what do y'all, uh, think of this, and, and then they'll finalize it by December. The other piece that's become clear now is that this has got to be a, a two-step process. So create that foundation and then tell the three divisions, okay, now you know where, where you can go. You know the fle flexibility and latitude you've got, then get after it. So most of the issues are in Division One. So the Division I membership now will be able to say, okay, we got a new, new scaffolding here to, to build around. It gives us more choices. Let's get in here and make choices. And, and my hope is, and, and the, the chairman of the D1 Board of Directors, uh, Jerry Moorhead, President Moorhead from uh, Georgia, wants to start that conversation, not wait till January, but start it soon, end of October, early November, 
bring together a little team of uh, a transition team or something like that. They've got to figure out what they want to call it of, of ADs and commissioners and faculty reps and everything and, and start pushing through that. So when they get to January, they're not saying, okay, now we start on D1 stuff. It'll be, okay, now we've got the freedom to do what we want. Let's get after it because the deadline for our implementation of everything's in, in August. So uh, two-step process, get the Constitution right, then D1, 2, and 3 can, can go from there, and then August 1, it's all, all in place. Well, and, and just to wrap up, I, you, know, you mentioned this earlier of the different interests in division, each division and within each division. Yeah. So to be yeah. clear, I mean, there are probably a number of schools, maybe conferences, uh, maybe even a division, that don't mind the status quo. Now, the status quo is not for everyone from one, two, and three, all levels, but how much are you seeing that, that some maybe don't want change or maybe are a little afraid of change versus the other group that definitely wants to move in a different direction? Yeah, look, the, the reality is, is that the system works remarkably well for the vast majority of schools and athletes. Uh, it, this is not like fixing a basket case. It's trying to take something that works pretty darn well and make it a lot better. Uh, for divisions two and three, uh, the system works particularly well there. They all have their tweaks that they'll want to add to it. Where the real challenge is, is in Division I, again, you've got schools that are small liberal arts colleges and the mega state universities and everything in between trying to sit down at the table and come together, and some of it works better from some than others. So they've got some, they've got some serious arm wrestling to do here. But that's the democratic process. I mean, most people don't understand that all, all the policies in the NCAA are handled through this demo representative democracy of schools coming together and, and arguing out what the rules should be. And, and now they're going to argue about how they get to argue. <laughs> and it'll all play out, hopefully, uh, within the next couple of months. All right, so yeah, a lot to yeah, digest, well. uh, a lot of information, and more to come. Uh, as always, you can go to ncaa.org slash social series where all our Social series are archived, uh, really, for the last uh, 18 to 20 months. Uh, Dr. Mark Emmert, thanks for joining us Pleasure. here in studio in Indianapolis. I'm Andy Katz. Thanks for watching.